Cyberbullying is, um, is quite prevalent in New Zealand. Um, the international research um, compares the prevalence of cyberbullying um, across, for instance, America, Canada, the UK. And New Zealand st statistics come in sort of pretty much in the middle of all of those countries. Um, around 15% of secondary school students report cyberbullying on mobile phones, and around um, between 10 to 20% of secondary school students report cyberbullying on the internet. Um, so combined, um, around 30% of New Zealand secondary school students um, reported some form of cyberbullying, either online or on mobile phones. As far as the rest of the world goes, it's actually really difficult to understand where New Zealand sits, and this is because um, research from around the world uses different measures for cyberbullying. So, for instance, some studies will only look at the internet, some studies look at mobile phones, and we are quite clear at NetSafe that cyberspace, particularly in the Web 2.0 era, is a sort of converged reality, and you can't really have the internet without mobile phones. But having said that, they are also distinct areas of cyberspace and they, they produce different things. Um, so some of the research has only looked at one modality of cyberspace and this means it's difficult to kind of establish where, where we fit. But um, from the analysis that we've done, it looks like New Zealand is pretty much kind of comparable to most places, maybe slightly overrepresented in cyberbullying statistics. But then equally there are some studies which show you know, sort of levels in the 60% for cyberbullying. But most of those have very problematic definitions of bullying, and that's probably a broader issue around how do we define and understand what bullying is. Cyberbullying is distressing for young people because it is a, a form of bullying. Um, obviously, it's cyberbullying, and, um, and it's a particular form of bullying. It's a form of bullying called covert bullying, and this is distinct from overt bullying. So overt bullying is the kind of obvious bullying. It's the overt stuff that you can see people doing to each other. It's the people being pushed around, the people being um, manhandled, people being told nasty things to their face, very overt kind of forms of bullying. Covert bullying works um, in secret in some ways. Covert bullying um, works by um, a range of strategies, including undermining that person's uh, social standing in their peer group. The whole aim of bullying is to, um, is to harm someone in some way. And if for teenagers, their social standing is such a critical part of their development. And so if you really want to be nasty and harm someone as a teenager, you harm their social standing. And you do that by spreading rumours about them. You do that by ignoring them, by ostracising them, by not letting them come to some of your social events, by setting up language that they can't understand, so secret codes, um, by writing mean things about them and telling other people about them. All of those things are ways that young people can use covert bullying to, to harass and harm an individual, and that's sort of at the crux of bullying. The difference, um, bullying has been around for years and years, and, and the difference now is that cyberspace has you know, obviously exploded into our world and brings with it so many positive aspects for young people in their development. And it also brings with it the opportunity for adults to actually have, a, I suppose, like a, a view of what teenagers get up to and, and what they do. And suddenly adults, as adults, were able to see what was probably happening behind the bike sheds, but we could never know about it. It also means that we're able to see all the covert forms of bullying that were very difficult to see um, before. So cyberspace has suddenly brought a lot of the kind of trickier elements of adolescent development into the open, really, so that we, we can't shy away from this stuff anymore. And that can sometimes lead us to think that this generation are worse than previous generations. But in reality, we, we can't actually compare that. It's apples and oranges, because essentially what we have now is just a much better way of understanding what they're doing than we did, for instance, in, in my day when... There's no way that I would have been able to see any covert bullying that was done about me because I may not have come across it. And neither would the adults in my school or the, the adults in my personal life have encountered that stuff either.
Cyberbullying, um, like all forms of bullying, can result in um, distress and significant distress for some young people. Um, the research around um, the effects of bullying um, shows that there's a differential effect depending on overt versus covert bullying. Um, ironically, the overt bullying, which is associated with you being pushed and shoved, obviously, can be associated with less um, significant psychological distress than covert bullying. And covert bullying can be associated with symptoms of depression and anxiety, obviously a very negative feeling towards school and therefore learning. And that can apply to overt bullying, but the results are much more uh, are clear that covert bullying is significantly more distressing for young people. Um, and what happens in adolescence, adolescence is a time of, of growth and development, and it's also a very stressful time because it's all about change, and usually most people find change a bit stressful, and this is also the case for adolescents. So they have a level of stress already in their lives, and bullying and harassment can just add a whole bunch of extra stresses into their lives. Um, and when you're dealing with young people who have multiple stresses happening in them, for instance, young people who are in care, young people who have an abusive environment at home, or young people who have learning difficulties, um, bullying and harassment adds another stressor onto that, that load for young people. And obviously one of the concerns is when bullying intersects with all of these other stresses and young people become suicidal. It's not to say that bullying makes people suicidal, but bullying is a stressor, and we know that stressors predispose people to mental illness, including suicidality, and that's one of the sort of really dangerous outcomes of bullying, really, is that potential to overload young people so they become suicidal. Um, when we think about distress and cyberbullying and bullying, it's really important to keep in mind that young people all have a, their own individual life history, their own life story, and they'll have their own resiliencies and competencies and ways of understanding situations. So two young people may find the same situation very different in terms of distress. Many young people are actually quite good at shrugging things off and saying, oh, it doesn't really bother me, and they genuinely mean it doesn't bother them. But however, for some young people, they do find these situations very distressing. So. At NetSafe, we know it's very important not to presuppose that young people will be distressed by bullying, but it's also important not to assume that they will absolutely be fine and it won't be an issue for them. It's very much around that individual young person and where they're at and, you know, in terms of what stresses else are sort of happening for them and how meaningful they find the bullying to be as well. Cyberbullying um, is really challenging for adults, obviously, because it happens, it's got the potential to happen 24-7, and that's very different to traditional face-to-face -face bullying, which was very much constrained to the physical environment where a young person was likely to be harassed. With cyberbullying, it suddenly means that young people face this when they go home, on their way to school, and there's really good research from uh, Australia actually demonstrating how frequent uh, these other form, other locations are in bullying. And that's difficult for, for adults because it means that they can't always control that situation. And I think traditionally we like to think because adults are apparently in control of our physical environments, they have some mandate over managing bullying. However, cyberbullying can happen on any um, cyber technology at any time. And this is a challenge for adults because they want to be involved and they want to help but they often don't know how. They can't necessarily punish someone because they don't know that it's happening, they don't see it happening. Um, so that's, that's one of the key, key issues for adults is them finding a productive role that they can take. Um, another issue for adults uh, involves what they do when they are made aware of a cyberbullying issue. Um, and our research very strongly demonstrates that adults have a very significant role to play in managing bullying at situations so they're positive for young people. That's to say that they don't respond by um, acting dramatically. Um, it's very important that they do not uh, take away the technology and the mistaken belief that they're going to help that young person by removing this sort of problematic technology. We know that cyberspace is a critical developmental setting for young people and without them having access to this space, they will struggle. 
they will struggle to get support from their friends as well when they're in a bullying situation. So removing the technology is absolutely the last thing that adults need to do. They don't need to respond with stress and drama. Instead, they need to be very open with that young person and say they're worried about what's happening, uh, they feel sorry for them, and just to listen to that young person as they talk about what's happening and then work with them around what a solution may be. Um, we know from our research that around 40% of the bullying situations involve a, um, a bullying producer at the same school as the target of the bullying. So that also clearly highlights that school adults have a role to play in managing bullying too.